I think we all know that human lifespan has been increasing. We can see here, uh, this is the year, I hope, I don't know if you, you probably can't read those, they're too small, and the life expectancy and how over the years since 1840, it's gradually increase, increasing. And maybe some of you also heard the news that uh, for the first time, it looks as though lifespan may not continue to increase for various reasons, including, I think, obesity as a major one. Here we can see the life expectancy at birth against the here, and this is 75 and 100, and this is the countries. And you can see it ranges um, in Macedonia and Serbia to about 70 eight years old expecta expectation, going up to, in Japan, France, and South Korea, uh, up to over 90. And so we have this very uh, positive development that we are living longer. And the world record holder for aging is uh, Jean-Louise Calmont. Um, and she lived to be aged 122. I think she smoked until she was over 100, incidentally. <laughs> but of course, there are also, through diseases, progerias, um, people who are born healthy, but begin to age very rapidly when they're still young toddlers. And the average age of life is only 13 years. So clearly, there can be very big differences in lifespan. And what we've also discovered over the last <coughs> really 20 years is that if we look at model organisms, mutations in single genes in the insulin and IGF and the TOR pathways actually extend lifespan in these model organisms. So here we can see C. elegans and here with one variant, one mutation in DAF2, which is the insulin receptor, the lifespan, the, the maximum lifespan increases from 30 to over 70. So that's a doubling of lifespan. Here you can see for flies and here you can see for mice. And in fact, what turns out is that these mutations are additive. They don't just if one occurs, the other one knocks it back again. Actually, as you do more mutations, these organisms, the simple organisms, yeast and worms, can live up to 10 times as long. Now, for flies and mice, that doesn't appear to be true in the sense that we can only currently extend lifespan by about one and a half times. For humans, we don't know. And of course, this has many ethical issues you can imagine if we all lived till we were 200 by taking a pill, the impact that that would have on society. But not only do mutant mice live longer, they also, and this is the most important thing, they stay healthier so that they have better glucosastasis, their immunity is better, their motor function is better, and all the things that we classically associate with disease, like osteoporosis and cataract and skin diseases, there's less of them. So you can see quite clearly here, the control here looking very old and miserable, and the mutant mouse there looking much younger. And you don't actually need statistics to be able to recognize that this is having an effect on aging. And in fact, dietary restriction has been known for a long time to extend lifespan. And now the experiments have been done in all these different organisms that are shown here. And that in every case, there is evidence that lifespan is extended, for including in, uh, both in dogs and in rhesus monkeys. So this isn't something that's restricted to, you know, small organisms. It applies right up the, the evolutionary scale, if you like. 
And if one looks at the uh, primates, the, the, um, here we can see the monkeys. Uh, here we have the control monkey. And here we are, have this, the thinner, calorically restricted monkey. And not only do they live longer, but all of these factors are improved. And that's presumably why they live longer. But the fact is, it's not just one thing that changes, it's many things that change. And so to summarize that, we can say that aging is malleable. And in these model organisms can be ameliorated by mutations in single genes, which I find astounding. I would never have thought that that was the case. We know that nutrient sensing is one of the aspects, though those networks play an evolutionary conserved role in aging, and these variants occur usually in the text end lifespan in the nutrient sensing networks. We also know that if you eat less, and it's quite a lot less, it's about 60% less, then you will live longer. But we all know that as we've seen, although we are having extended lifespan, this living longer comes at a cost. And the cost is that aging is the major risk factor for the chronic and killer diseases. So dementia, cardiovascular disease, and cancer all kick in, and you can see the increase in prevalence, this is percentage, goes from at 60 for dementia, the prevalence is two or three percent. By the time you're 95 for females, the prevalence is 50 percent. For cardiovascular disease, this is starting at 16 to 24, so already some people have cardiovascular disease while they're quite young, but it increases all the way up, this is only 60 odd. And you can see here, there's already an increase at 60, increasing rapidly up to about 50% over 75 year olds. And if we look at cancer, the same sort of pattern, again, this takes off very clearly. Um, and you can see the smooth curves, we've got more people, <laughs> um, that, that gradually at the age of 60, there's a radical increase for female and even greater for male. So although we're living longer, we're also getting many different diseases as we get older. And multimorbidity, i.e. lots of diseases, is extremely common in late life. And so there's a figure that the average 70 year old has about seven chronic conditions on average which is huge. And you can see here, this covers the whole of biology in some ways, from the cardiovascular, to the epithelial, to the musculoskeleton, to, of course, eyes, ears. We all know, as everybody we know, as, <laughs> and individually, as we get older, we all begin to wear glasses. You will notice all of your friends start wearing reading glasses when they're about 45 to 50 and so on, and then people start going gray when they get 50 to 60. So aging isn't something that just happens when you get to 60 or 70, it's a continuous process. And these, this multimorbidity is a real challenge because, of course, this is what costs the NHS. The last six months of life costs the NHS, I don't know what percentage is, I can't remember, but it's vast, it's something like 60, 70, 80% of the NHS cost is in the last six months of life. And it's caused by this multi a lot of it, by all the different diseases. And we all know our, our um, aged relatives take multiple pills for everything. Anyway, so the concept is that we might be able to target aging to prevent multiple diseases of aging. So we target here and we protect against these age-related diseases. Now, the question, of course, then arises, well, can drugs modulate aging and extend health span? And this is really what we all want. As somebody who's getting older, what you want is to be perfectly fit and then drop off the end of the cliff. <laughs> you don't want to go through 20 years of not being able to eat properly, not being able to walk, not being able to sleep, et cetera, et cetera. 
We want to improve late life health. Of course, the concept of living longer, developing the elixir of youth has been around for a very, very long time. And there are many different pills that are sold in theory to make you live longer. Reproducibility is a little less clear to say the least. Um, and so one has to take these a bit at the moment with a pinch of salt. But the fact is that, that because aging is malleable, it could be that drugs, some drugs, multiple drugs, I don't know, could make late life healthier. And I think we would all vote for that. And one example, of course, dietary restriction, we already know if you stop eating and only eat 60% of your normal diet, you will probably live longer. Now, can you reproduce that with a drug? So the DR mimetic, dietary restriction mimetic, rapamycin that hits the mTOR complex, that gives an extension of lifespan in mice. So you can see here, these are classic lifespan. So this is survival against age, and the red ones are the rapamycin, and mice live for longer. Here we can see the drug rapamycin and the rapamycin-treated mouse. So clearly, at the moment, rapamycin is, is used after tissue transplantation, um, but maybe it's something that one could take to improve health in old age. In fact, the first clinical trial for aging, metformin, is currently under study. Um, I'll come back to that. But there are real challenges for to translate findings into drugs. Um, the goal is increased health span. So does one have to give long-term treatment? Can you just treat when you get old or do you need to treat much younger and take the pills? And so the safety issues for drugs become much more serious because if you're going to take them when you're middle-aged, say, or even younger, then you've got a lifetime of taking drugs, which I guess is good for pharma profit, <laughs> but the, the side, side effects are going to be much more serious. And so the safety issues, how we regulate this, how do you say, well, you're perfectly well, but you should take this drug? Do we really want to say that? And of course, all of the money to develop such drugs and to test them sensibly is very difficult. The FDA is not set up to do the, these sort of things. So we have some major, that you can see there's this goal somewhere in the future. The question is, is it possible? And at the background of this are real big scientific challenges. We don't really understand the molecular basis, bases of aging yet. We don't understand how it works. We don't really understand how aging leads to diseases most of the time. We don't, if we don't want to test things in humans, we have to test them in model organisms. How best to do that? And of course, the concept of repurposing drugs, which has been around for ages now, is very attractive from this perspective, partly because it's relatively quick in the scheme of things, and it could be, may be used to improve this late life health. So if we look at the hallmarks of aging, here we can see, taken from a paper by a set of aging researchers, um, all the different hallmarks of aging. And if we, just you can see they cover everything from genomic stability, epigenetics, mitochondrial dysfunction, altered uh, communication, immunology, of course. And if we just consider one of these, the loss of proteostasis, about 810 genes are involved in maintaining proteostasis in the lab. So that's a huge, just on its own, that one aspect covers a huge fraction of the genome. And in fact, if you take into account all of these different things, you're covering <laughs> really most of the genome. 
And so the question we were interested in was whether any of the current approved drugs might have an impact on ageing. That, that was the question we, we started with. And of course, I'm a computational biologist at heart, and so the concept was to try to integrate the molecular data that we have to identify anti-aging small molecules, including obviously the small molecule, the drug data, the model organism data, the GWAS studies, all the pathways and networks and protein-protein inter interaction networks, knowing which proteins are associated with age and using homologs and evolution to map between organisms. And so I'm going to present three vignettes of things that we did to predict, if you like, I've called them anti-aging drugs, but I think the goal isn't to extend lifespan, it's to stop us suffering this multimorbidity in old age. So um, I'll, I'll go through these three different approaches that we've used. So the first was by, you can see, Matthias Fuentalbana from, from Chile. In the top right, he's a PhD student, and he's working jointly between myself and Linda Partridge. And the first concept is very simple. Let's look at the genes that we know are involved in aging and ask which of these genes already have drugs that target them. So this is a very simple concept. So we take the organism. Oh, sorry, this has gone funny. Oh, I didn't check it well enough. Uh, not on my computer, on this computer, I should say. Um, so we deal with multiple organisms, animal models and humans. We deal with drugs, genes, and transcriptomes. And we used various methods to compare between this data to find which might be the best drugs. And so, first of all, identify the drugs which target age-related genes. Now, those who are familiar with databases will know these databases. Those who aren't, don't worry about it. So there's a database on drugs called Stitch. We tie those in with Unichem to the, to the drugs and drug bank. And we find that in total, there are uh, 2,000, about 2,500 drugs that target about 3,000 proteins that have been associated with aging in some way. That's a lot of things. So, of course, the first question is, how do you prioritize them? And so we took all the aging-related genes from um, a recent paper in 2018, and we combined data on aging, data on age-related diseases, data on gene expression, data on DNA methylation, and we identified the genes present in more than one category here, just to be on the safe side. So we end up with about 1,200 genes by combining these different types of data. And then we compare how many of those genes, the 1,200, are actually aging-related genes, and that comes out at about 500. And most of these drugs have multiple targets, and there are about 1,100 drugs that would target these genes. And so for each drug, we need to test if it has a specificity for aging-related targets. And so we can rank order the drugs to test if a drug preferentially targets aging-related genes more than you expect for a drug with a given promiscuity. So for example, resveratrol uh, targets 66 of the aging-related genes out of its 216 target genes. So you can work out the probability that a given drug is more likely to target aging genes than expected on the basis of chance. And on that basis, you can produce a rank order. And from that rank order, you can see these are the top 20 drugs that have an adju their adjusted p-values uh, probabilities of occurrence. And you can see that the top drug here is resveratrol, which is the one that I showed with all of the anti-aging. So 
in a sense, this is inevitable because you're putting in the data already about the drugs that target aging and the genes that are aging. So this is somewhat circular, but it does give you a strong list to prioritize. You'll also notice here that there are three in red that you as drug uh, people will recognize as being uh, very nasty drugs that basically just kill cells off. So these are drugs that hit aging related genes, but don't necessarily make you live longer. They can make you live shorter as well. So this is a combination, if you like, of good anti-aging drugs and pro-aging drugs here. So this is one method. We can also then add in all the information about protein-protein interactions, the gene ontology, and pathways. And basically, oops, sorry. Oh, oh sorry, I went the wrong way. Um, and basically do the same calculation for each of those different data sources uh, as, as seen there. And then we can look at the correlation between drugs, but we can basically add all of those rank orderings together and come up with an average so we can rank order according to all of those, the, the, the genes, the protein-protein interactions, the GO ontology, the pathways, KEG and reactome, and come up with an average ranking. And just for later, just if you just note that top of this list is tanospermycin. So we will um, come back to that later. So that's one approach. Second approach is quite different. And this has the advantage that it really doesn't use the knowledge of aging genes at all in the approach. But it's an approach that's been well worn for other sorts of drugs. So here you effectively use the gene expression changes as a surrogate to find the most relevant drugs. So you basically um, identify robust gene expression changes during aging and then you find drugs that target the same genes. So we use the connectivity map from the Broad Institute that I'm sure most of you will be familiar with to look at the expression changes. And that map gives you for 1,300 or 5,000 small molecule compounds expression signatures for each of those compounds. And so you compare effectively an aging signature with the expression signature for the drug. So my student Melika put together seven different uh, data sets on aging. And here you can see the expression data, the usual heat map, red for uh, up, green, uh, blue for down, and she just extracted from these seven disparate data sets all those genes that consistently expression went down and the genes that consistently the expression went up. So seven independent studies. This, this is all brain data, and there are questions about that, but that was what we used. The age of the, the uh, people ranged from 20 to 106. There were 20, what, 26 sub-data sets in total, and they were all microarray data, not RNA-seq, because they were quite old data, um, but, and on different platforms. So this gave us an aging signature that you can see here for different genes. The genes that robustly go down in expression with age and the genes that robustly increase their expression with age. And then... So one of the questions is, um, of course, microarray in some senses is older technology. What about if we look at RNA-seq? Do we get the same sort of data? So we looked at the GTEC brain data, the same. This is, a, uh, they divided it into 13 brain regions and they, a smaller group, the age range wasn't so large. So GTEC is well-known data for those in the field, it's, it's a very large data set that is publicly available. And then we compare the, these signatures from both of those with the drug signatures from the connectivity map. And 
get the similarity scores between the gene expression signature and the signature for the drugs. We looked at this comparison between the uh, brain aging array signatures and the GTEC data. And as usual with expression data, I don't know if people in the audience are used to dealing with expression data, but in my experience, when you try to compare expression signatures from different organisms and from, from different uh, cells and everything, the overlap is nearly always zero. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's a, a, a very difficult um, technology, actually, because expression is so changeable. It's very difficult. But nevertheless, there are some, there are 48 down-regulated genes that are common, and there are 50 up-regulated genes. So this resort comes down to this. If we compare, you can see this is the scatter plot for the expression signatures. The correlation is there. It's not brilliant, as we wouldn't expect for expression data, but it's clearly there. So that gave us a bit more confidence in, in the microarray. So what we did then was just find which drugs were consistently correlated with these aging expression. And we came up with a list of drugs. And I, I have to say that uh, Melika arrived in the lab and within a month she had produced this list because she'd been working on the brain data before and she brought it to me. And what you see in red are known aging drugs. And I was absolutely staggered because in my hands, expression data has never really given such a, um, a result. I really was flabbergasted that this had worked at all. And so these drugs were effectively rediscovered. And also we see uh, other drugs, and you'll notice here, tanospermycin, uh, just for comment, um, that have led to this rank-ordered list of drugs. So some of them are known aging drugs, others are potentially new ones. So the third vignette is then the one to, for drug repurposing for longevity studies in model organisms. So this is a different question, but it's again one that computational biology can potentially address. And this was Matthias Syme, who was my PhD student, and he did this Oh, actually, probably three or four, four years ago now, at least. And the problem that he saw and that he was interested to address is that, of course, survival experiments, all the survival experiments that have been done, are really predominantly in worms, flies, and mice. Very few in rat and humans. Quite difficult to do experiments on humans. If we look at the proteins, the targets, the genes, the structures, because he was uh, interested, I'm a structural biologist, and he wanted to learn about structural biology when he was in the lab. But most of those structures aren't actually from the model organisms. They're usually from, the, from man, increasingly, or from bacteria, not so much for these model organisms. And of course, the drugs predominantly are for human, and they are mice and flies, so mice and, and rat. So actually you've got survival curves for the model organisms and drugs for the, for the uh, higher primates. So how do you map between, how do you, if you want to take one of these human drugs, you want, um, sorry, you want to test it, I think, before you start giving it to human beings, you want to test it for its effect on model organisms. So you want to go through and find out which of these drugs, because clearly if a drug targets a protein or a gene that isn't in a model organism, there's no point testing it in that model organism. So there are only limited drugs that it makes sense to test. So this is what he sought to do. Um, so he wanted to identify, first of all, he used aging genes and asked, which, can we predict the drugs active against proteins implicated in aging in invertebrates using information from vertebrates? That was, that was the concept. So the process 
was to find the aging-related genes, to find the homologs in the other organisms, to look at the structures and the chemistry, the binding constants, find structures with co-crystallized compounds, explore the binding sites and the multiple alignments, and predict the most probable drugs to interact with genes that will extend lifespan in worms and flies. So one of the big problems, of course, is that we don't really know that much about how these drugs get into worms and flies, which are the classic organisms that are used for longevity studies. There is one paper that was published uh, where they did a high throughput assay, and Matthias used this data to, as one of the scores. So he, he went about, and maybe, I don't know in drug companies whether you do this, but this was, I would call it creative bioinformatics. He created a function that included all of these different things. Of course, you don't have a clue how to weight them and what to do, and you really just make a best guess. And he came up with a ranking score that would then allow him to produce a list of those drugs that he thought we could test in flies or worms. This is, this is what, basically what he did. He went on then, and for, what, for, for these drugs, he tested to check whether we could actually, this is the human with uh, imatinib, and here we have another one. So we can build a, the structure of the fly or the worm analog and try and dot the, the, the drug into it to make sure that it can fit in the, the binding site, basically. So he did this and came up with a list. There are many limitations to this approach. Um, I, I started out originally as a physicist, and this sort of approach make me, makes me squirm. I mean, it is, it is not, in some ways, scientific, but it's probably the best we can do, given the information we've got. So it's really not quantitative in the way that I like to see. Many factors are conflated into just one score, for this, we needed the, target stru the structure of the target proteins, and we know we, we still don't have that for many of these, these targets. Um, we, because it's based on known aging-related proteins, you can't discover new targets, and it ignores all of the protein-protein interaction availability, and also the bioavailability data is very limited. We have almost nothing in flies to speak of. So these are three different approaches. So they all give rank ordered lists. So what do we do? Can we test any of them? So what Matthias did using his approach was to rank order. And at the top of his list, as I pointed out before, was tanospermycin. And this was present in Melika's list from the expression data here. And it was also, well, actually, the drug wasn't present, but the target of the drug was present in, uh, in Matthias's, the other Matthias, the, the German Matthias's data. And so we thought this was a good drug to test. It's an HSP90 inhibitor. HSP90 is a chaperone, and it inhibits it. One would immediately think this would be bad for aging. You know, you're inhibiting something that chaperones proteins. In fact, what we found was, um, and the way you test it is through activation of heat shock factor one. So this was work in UCL by Jonathan Labadia, his, his lab and Rihanna Williams, and they tested it in C. elegans. This is marvelous because he already had the system set up and it really took four weeks to test this. And what you can see is that the lifespan was an extension from here, the green, to the red. So there was an extension of 23% in the C. elegans. Now, whether that means that will work in humans, of course, who knows? We don't know. So this, I think, is the state of play. Uh, we, I've presented, I should have, sorry, I took the slide out. Um, there have been other attempts to do this sort of work. And in fact, we've just written a review about this. This has just been sent off, um, where people have looked at trying to rank order these drugs uh, using different methods. When you look at them, you find that the different methods give different targets, 
and that when you map those targets onto keg pathways, you find that almost all the pathways are involved in potential aging. So aging, as we all know, <laughs> doesn't just affect one part of our body, doesn't just affect one type of cell. It is really, I don't know what word is to describe it, but it's, it's in all cell types, all different parts of the body, etc. And so potentially, the good news is that there are many drugs that might help to ameliorate it. And of course, what one wants to do is to integrate the clinical and the molecular data to try to understand this issue about what determines disease age of onset, what's the link between aging and age-related diseases, and are there common pathways important in multiple late onset diseases? So there's lots of now clinical data that with some difficulty, but nevertheless one can access with all the open access molecular data where Emberly BI, of course, has many of these resources that we can use. And so one of the recent things, and Malika has moved on from looking at the molecular data to look at some of this clinical data in UK Biobank. And of course, you will be familiar, UK Biobank has 500,000 participants. There's demographics, there's medical, there's lifestyle information. Um, they're about half and half. They're not clinical. Uh, unlike other genomes, they, are not, they don't have necessarily have diseases or they have multiple diseases. They're just people off the street, if you like. Um, some of these participants actually have already died, but because this hasn't been going very long, um, it's, the participants are only up to 75, so we haven't got really old people there yet. And the, but even so, one can look at the age of death, um, which looks something like this, and you can see uh, this is a maximum age of death. You can uh, infer the probable age of death from the parent age of death. Um, and you can, this is the age at which the people attended to have assessment. So what Malika has done is to look at the self-assessment data that's in UK Biobank. So some of the people are 40, some are 50, the majority are 60 going down to 70 here. So this is the age distribution of people in UK Biobank. So we looked at these self-reported diseases because we were interested in this problem of what's the relationship between age and diseases? Why is aging such a major risk factor for these diseases? And this is just the beginning and we've not really got any proper results yet, but I just wanted to give you a flavor of this. This, this, was, um, this is the ontology for those of you who know about ontology, this is a, a, a medically derived ontology derived by the, by the clinicians, basically. And you can see it's very fat, flat. And um, people filled in the questionnaire with, the, um, with nurses. So they had some guidance. It was a self-questionnaire, but they weren't on their own in their houses. They were actually sitting with a nurse going through it. And so you can ask which diseases co-occur. And this is the ontology, this is using this ontology. And I don't know if you can see, oh, you can't see it terribly well. Um, but you can see that the cardiovasculars are here, the gastrointestinal are here, the musculoskeletal are here. So it's the way that we describe diseases, actually. It's the way that medics tend to describe diseases by the parts of the body. Um, so you can then say, well, um, what's the age of onset of different diseases? So when you look at the, you can see this is the age of onset, and there are different ages of onset uh, for different um, types of protein, different types of diseases. And you can see these cluster quite nicely into different groups depending on the profiles. And then, so here you can see if we, so I'm, I'm just going to go through these profiles and look at them. So this one, this is bone disorder, osteoporosis, diabetes, glaucoma, stroke, 
uh, the age of onset profile looks like this. This is slightly different. This is more than the um, peripheral no, eye disease and um, renal disease some of the, and, and retinal disease. This is tuberculosis, obviously viral infection, which occurs when you're young rather than when you're older. And then there's this one, which is to do with things like fractured limbs, um, asthma, and other things. So you can see you have very different age of onset profiles here. And when you then go back to this curve, but then you, instead of coloring by the profile, the age of onset profile, you then color according to the uh, groups defined by the clinicians here, what you see that the, um, you no longer see the nice clustering. So the different ages of onset occur for different parts of the body, as we would expect. So if there's a molecular basis for this, we know that this could occur in different parts of the body and you wouldn't just expect you know, the heart disease to all to be the same and to kick in there. So this shows that there is something quite interesting to look at in this data. And of course, we have the genotype data for these, these individuals, and so one can begin to do GWAS, disease GWAS, those sorts of things for this and look at the other things. So that really concludes what I want to say. I have to say, this is actually more of a call to arms than a presentation of results. I think this area of research is really extremely interesting and it has huge potential for health benefits in old age. And so there are many, many outstanding questions. Will drugs that expend lifespan in model organisms translate effectively to improve late life health in humans? Frankly, we don't know. Can we predict the effect of a drug considering its mechanism of action and evolutionary relationships? Now, the drug companies have been trying to do this for many years. It's really challenging because of the complexity of human biology. Whoops. Will, by combining the molecular and the clinical data, will we begin to understand the causes and effects of aging and allow us to differentiate? So what was interesting is some of the drugs that we found actually correlate more with what we think of as our response to aging than the actual aging. And so it's quite difficult to tease apart effect because you can't not age. <laughs> you can't have a, a simple sort of uh, with disease, without disease, you know, you always are aging. What's the best approach to test such drugs experimentally in humans? And how can we avoid serious side effects for the long term? What are the robust biomarkers for aging? Obviously, we have the epigenetic clocks for aging. They're quite powerful. I think we have yet to see whether they will be useful in experiments, but I think they will certainly in the cell uh, environment. And can we utilize the epidemiological studies and clinical data to really study the effects of drugs on lifespan? How do we combine this data together? And I firmly believe that it'll be the bridge between the clinical and molecular that will hold the future for aging research in humans. So then just to make my acknowledgement, um, I'd like to thank Matthias here, uh, who did the work on the structural data and, and uh, identifying drugs for testing in model organisms. Um, another Matthias, uh, German Matthias, <laughs> Chilean Matthias here, uh, who's based in Linda's lab, but spends a lot of time uh, at EBI as well. And Melika, who has done the work on the um, expression data. Linda Partridge, I've worked with her now for way over 20 years on, on this aging, and she is a driving force and great, great to work with. And of course, the Labadia lab, who did the testing of tonospermycin. So I hope I've given you... I've. I'd like to think that I might have inspired you to go back and think about the ageing problem and ask whether there is anything you might do to address it as part of your work. Because age comes with every other day. The one thing we do always have with data 
is the age of the participant. And so I think there are many different ways that we can look at this and hopefully find something that will stop the multimorbidity of old age. Thank you.